join me today at the wheel of an 80s hot hatch super mini. Yes, I'm driving an MG Metro, yeah. Hello, welcome to Furious Driving, and today we're looking at another Metro, because let's face it, everyone loves a Metro, right? Okay, not everyone, okay, well, most people are pretty fond of Metros. Still too strong, okay. Some people don't hate them, so we're doing a third one. But this is the first time we've done an MG Metro, so it's a little bit special today. So the Metro first appeared as the Austin Mini Metro in 1980. It was a fairly basic, affordable car with a few options and things you could throw on it and different trim levels and things. Then in 1982, they decided they were gonna go the badge engineering route and bring back some names from the past. First of all, there was the VP, the Vandem Plus, which was the luxury version, bringing back that old evocative name from days gone by, which had the wood, the Wilton, all the good comfy stuff, and a 1.3 litre engine at first. But then this is what we have today, the MG version. The MG Octagon had been killed off in 1980 with the death of the MGB, it was brought back, but not as a separate car, but as a badge engineering exercise, first of all on the Metro, later on on the Maestro and the Montego. So let's take a quick step back in time to the late 60s into the early 70s and the long drawn out development of the Metro. First of all it started off as the ADO 88, the amalgamated drawing office 88 inch wheelbase, which was kind of this kind of thing. It was a Harris Mann design, but new management and customer focus groups basically said it looked bland, boring, utilitarian and like a van and they did not like it. So fresh from his SD1 efforts, David Back was brought in in order to oversee the restyle of what became the LC8 as in Leyland Cars number eight, which was the Metro. Now, in order to make it into an MG rather than a boring Austin, we had a few little extra bells and whistles thrown on. We've got the lattice alloy wheels, which were the signifier of anything posh or performance in the early 80s. Have a look at a Mark II Cavalier CD if you get the opportunity. You'll find them under there. And of course, the BMW E30. Another home for an E, another fine home for a lattice wheel. Along the flanks, we have, of course, got the MG Metro graphics. These are reproduction graphics because the car's been repainted not so long ago, but these are pinpoint perfect reproductions are exactly as they were. And at the back, we've got this wraparound spoiler on the rear window, and of course, MG badging all over the car. Now the Metro was facelifted in 1984, and this being a 1988 car, obviously benefits from those uplifts. These include new front end treatments, so different grille, different headlights, and the bumper is now changed and body colored on the MG versions. Very swanky. And of course, the big thing to look at on the front is the MG Octagon. But the big difference which really does matter is under the bonnet. So lifting this tiny bonnet, well not mini tiny, but still pretty diminutive bonnet, you will find an A-series, but not as we've seen before. This is the 1275 from a Mini Cooper, but it has been significantly breathed on. It's now got a modified cylinder head with bigger valves and improved porting for better gas flow, and a new camshaft with different intervals and durations. And it has a bigger SU carb than the Mini had. So the whole thing just breathes and runs more easily and more powerfully. In fact, it makes about 20% more power than it did in the Mini. In standard form, this will put out 72 horsepower. This car has actually been modified some more, so it's actually making around 84 horsepower. So it should be even more exciting. The MG Metro Turbo, which is the one people often think this, these cars are when they see them on the street, actually made 94 straight out of the box. Another thing to look at whilst we've got the bonnet up is the front suspension. The 1984 facelift also brought wider subframes, but that's not what we're looking at. What we are looking at are these gold turrets here, because this car has got hydro gas on it. So like minis, like MGFs as well, we've got a non-spring suspension system. This car, having been restored, has actually had this not just regassed, but fully rebuilt. So when we hit the road, I'm really looking forward to seeing how this thing handles. So let's have a look at this interior. Look, first of all, we've got the later style post facelift door handles, which are a little bit smoother and nicer. And we've got MG heel pads, heel mats in the carpet. I don't know if this is aftermarket or because this car has been restored a lot. I don't know how much has been done inside. So let's have a look at what we've got. Now, because MG, we've got exciting red, orangey trims, making the thing a bit more excitable than usual. In the center of the steering wheel, we've got the big MG Octagon logo in red. We've got a bit of red stitching on the wheel as well. And on the dashboard, we've got this amazing 1980s red graph paper, making it all very exciting and scientific and computery and you know, 1980 futuristic -y stuff. So yes, I'm babbling because it's so exciting. Let's start on the door and work our way around. Now, first of all, 
It's a 1980 small car, so we have got a bit of body color metal on the top of the doors. You'll find it on the B posts as well. We have also got maneuverable mirrors, but it is a manually maneuverable mirror up here on the A post. Moving down into these door cards, which are vinyl at the top and located actually quite well and cleverly positioned, or well positioned, I should say. We've got our manual windows, quite light and uh, fragile feeling plastic, although it's lasted this long with no problems. And a likewise plasticky door handle all very Austin so far. Then we've got a nice tweedy carpet insert underneath the uh, exciting plastic orange uh, stripe, which is fully three-dimensional, I'll have you know. Um, this is uh, Aztec Tweed. I don't know if that's a real thing or not, but it, I'm gonna claim it as my own for Aztec Tweed. This is a good thing. Just push it around a bit so you can see the door armrest and handle. So we've got a solid plastic armrest, so we can rest our arm. And then molded into it is the tiniest little nubbin of a door pull for shutting the door tight. So you can just get your fingertips in there, slam the door, and that contains a small, well, actually not bad size pocket for maps, books, sandwiches, very narrow drinks, Capri Suns, and maybe the odd sherbet dip or two. And in front of that, we have our speaker. And because it's the 80s, the speaker grill is diagonal. This is essential in 1980s cars, of course. Now, moving into the dashboard. Now, the 1984 facelift had brought about a new dashboard. So we have got the switch gear from the Maestro and Montego, which unifies the range somewhat, but also these do look very SD1-ish in my opinion, rather than anything else. Big chunky buttons for the controls here and another further couple of chunky buttons down here. We're missing one option down here. This would be either ejector seat, oil slick, or sharp things falling out the back. Then we have got our wiper stalk, which has got multi-position intervalometer. And of course, washers, not turned on at the moment. And the left-hand side, we've got a mirror image of that little adjuster, which gives us light side lights and headlights. And on the end, we've got the, the horn. <laughs> Yay, excellent. Now, this steering wheel is a big flat dish, three spoke sporty wheel, firmly padded leather, gray, which matches the dashboard. It's a gray with a hint of a hint of brown, flat dished with the MG logo in the center. And as I said, nice bit of red stitching. It looks brilliant. It does look so nice. Being a pre airbag wheel, it's flat faced, quite slim, very elegant looking. And our hazard lights are up here in the middle. In the center of the dials, we have got a big panel of warning lights, including the caravan light. I'm not sure you'd be buying an MG Metro to be uh, towing a caravan with, unless you want to get on holiday fast, in which case you probably wouldn't be towing a caravan. The dials are an interesting layout. If you notice on the left-hand side, we've got this semi-circular sweep for the rev counter, followed by two hanging needles for the fuel and temperature. And on the right-hand side, we've got another semicircle, but canted over to 45 degrees for the speedometer going up to 130 miles an hour. Now, I believe the top speed on the non-turbo Metro was 101, but it always looks good to have the extra 29 miles an hour on your dial. Over to the left of that, we've got our little pod of heating and ventilation controls. And next to that, most important of all, we have our T-shelf because MG, Austin Rover, BL, they liked a T-shelf. Going back to the VP models with their wooden uh, tables which folded out, we do of course have a long lineage of excellent T-shelfery. But of course, being the 1980s, what was king of the high street? It was Wimpy Burger. So this is ideally placed for a large Wimpy Burger and fries and probably a milkshake. Now below this large T-shelf, rubberized, so if you have spillages, you can take that indoors and wash it. A flat area, ideally placed for an airbag in the future, perhaps. This, of course, is so on left-hand drive models, you can run your steering column through there. Either side of that and following onto the other side of the dashboard, we have got four well-sized and well-placed air vents. And in the middle, we have got the original cassette receiver made by Philips, no less. I think Philips did a lot of Rover radios back in the day. Under that, we've got our big sweetie wrapper hole receptacle, lighter for 12 volts. And next to we have something which many younger viewers may not recognize. This is the choke, a manual choke in 1988. Most things have gone to full auto choke by this point. And uh, a small glove box with two additional T-shelf cup holders. Below that, we have got prime 1980s real estate in the form of a cassette holder for five tapes held up vertically so you can read the spines and behind that we've got the four speed manual gearbox the four speed manual was the only option for manual there was an automatic in some versions of the car available behind the gear shift we have got a very chunky indeed handle on the uh, handbrake 
and we do of course have bright red carpet because this is the exciting sporty model so nothing says sporty and exciting more than red carpet and I'm not going to disagree with that in any way shape or form. Now up here on the seats we've got more of the Aztec tweed which looks very cool indeed more red piping so giving them more sportiness and headrests very interestingly sculpted look at the shape of this this is very cool indeed up above we've got a quartz clock quartz still being a thing to actually mention and advertise around that and a pop-up sunroof which i believe is factory not aftermarket looking at the moldings and the headlining now access into the back on the mg version is by this little plastic lever on the side to flip forward there was a five door version of the metro available as well which made it quite a contender against many of its rivals we've got more of this amazing aztec tweed red piping velour and a 60 40 split folding seat so pretty decent space let's climb in and have a quick try and of course we, i didn't mention in the front we've got red seat belts which are premium sportiness making the car very sporty indeed and uh oh, can i fit the seat back yeah just i mean if you're a kid going on holiday for a long time it'll probably be just about okay but for an adult it's a little bit tight on the knee room the windows don't open you do have fold out ashtray which are primed 70s and 80s fodder and a little recess indent so you can put stuff or rest your elbow in the side of the car and behind us we have got more speakers in the sides of the parcel shelf and a very large parcel shelf which doubles up as a huge tea shelf now the back of the car prime 1980s small car bootery we've got a plasticky vinyl lining on the sides and on the floor metal back of the seats which do fold down with the little lever just here oops that's now been done didn't mean to do that and under this carpet there is a little handle down here in the wood bit of plywood gives us wow look at that spare wheel full size lattice alloy hidden for its entire life under the boot of the car you'll notice it's only a 13 inch little tiny wheels on these things it's actually quite hard to buy premium quality 13 inch tires these days because the manufacturers have just kind of stopped making them right right let's take this thing out onto the road and see what it's like Oh, you've got that distinctive A-series wine from the front of the car. And the distinctive notchy Austin Rover gear shift. I'm not sure what gearbox this car actually has, I didn't think to check. Maybe if my mouth is moving and different words are coming out, I've bothered to go and tell you it's a PG1 or something. I honestly can't remember what these have, but it does feel very much like a, a slightly stiffer version of the, um, the gearbox in my coupe. You'll notice the uh, gearbox four speed, as I said, lift to get into reverse, but we're not going backwards right now. We're keeping on going forward. And I'll tell you what, if you've not driven a hydroelastic car for a while, you really do forget what they feel like, how, how soft and rolly they are, basically. They kind of lean into corners, but a wonderful grip. It's getting a bit warm, so I flick on the two-speed fans. Oh, I love that gearbox wine. It sounds like a straight-cut box. Well, and obviously it isn't, but... Oh, I'll lean through the corner. Love it. Feels like you're hooning because you're... on the door handles, but obviously you're not. This car is currently for sale at Stone Cold Classics at Rootham in Kent. Check out their website to see this and other fantastic cars they've got in stock down there at the moment. Link in the description below. The steering is lovely and light. There's a nice size steering wheel, you notice that pretty quickly. Though, although it's quite close to your knees and it's raked away from you, almost, well, horizontal almost. But it's uh, very easy to turn. nice fun thing to speed through the corners but the pedals the pedals are really small they're slightly offset to the left and the accelerator is actually a little bit diddly for my size 11 boots 
So this car was a real hit in the 80s actually because it was the performance people wanted but without the connotations the boy racer Essex boy thing where if you bought an XR2 from Ford or a Nova SRI you looked a little bit of a wide boy you buy this it's a little bit more grown up it's like a Golf GTI but uh, in a more diminutive package and the performance was pretty decent as well. 0 to 60, 10.1 seconds is quite admirable. Top speed, 101 miles an hour, which is more than fast enough in a car of this size. In standard form, it made 72 horsepower. This car's been breathed on, should be making about 84 or so. And uh, again, out of the box, 99 newton meters of torque. But again, more than admirable, respectable figures. And it does feel really fun and sporty. The only thing I'm noticing on this 50 mile an hour stretch of road is now that it does feel like it wants a fifth gear or an overdrive on it. You think maybe a fifth gear would be an option by 1988 on the premium car in the range. Although maybe they were hoping you'd uh, step up to the maestro rather than spring for a bit extra. Now, as I mentioned in the previous Metro videos, uh, these things had an astonishing run under what, three or four different changes of brand name from Austin through to Rover. 1980 they came out and 1998 they were finally killed off, which is just ridiculous in terms of, uh, of longevity. There are very few cars that can rival that. And the original Mini obviously trumps most other things in the Beetle, but those really are exceptions rather than the rule. Everything about driving this car is just peak 80s. The red seat belts, the graph paper speedometer, the square edges of everything, the, you know, the squareness of the car. I wish I'd worn red braces and brought a Filofax on this shoot. feel sucking through the carburetor just in front of you. It's huge fun just being part of this experience driving this car. And looking around you've got so much headroom in here and the A posts and B posts are so thin that the, means the glass area is enormous. These huge tall windows to the side of you and the great big windscreen in front. You can see everything as if you're not encompassed at all by a car. And it's quite cool having these little flashes of the red body colour. It's called Targa Red, I believe, which is perfect for a car like this. They, they kind of only really work if they're in this bright red, white or black. I don't know if there were other colours available, actually, but those are the three colours I kind of only remember. But certain cars really only work if you do them in those big, bold colours. I've never seen a yellow one. I wonder if a yellow would work on one of these. I don't mean, obviously, the primrosy yellow that you got on the on the, the uh, basic L models or the hearing aid beige. Hearing aid beige MG. Nah, I'm out. Now while I have got your attention, I will just say if you enjoy these videos and would like to help support the channel in any way, there are multiple ways you can do that. We've got Patreon and channel memberships with links in the description below which help keep this channel going. And also we've got plenty of merchandise options for you. These Quentin the Rover t-shirts are available and that's also as mugs, stickers, notebooks and likewise for the channel logo, the Furious Driving logo, Scrappage Skim Survivor, many Rover options and even Volvo and Alpha stuff. So do check out the links in the description below to help keep your favorite YouTubers on the road. Thank you. A hydroelastic suspension is very interesting. It feels just so soft and not exactly wallowy, but just very smooth. If you've only ever driven coil sprung cars, it may feel a bit like it's too soft, it's almost like the dampers have started to fail. But that's, that's how they are, they are just swooshy. Softly sprung, but great grip. This is why Minis, or partly why Minis originally had such incredible handling.
I know it was considered for the BMW Mini as well. And the creator of that system was most nonplussed when he discovered that they weren't going to be using his system on the new Mini. Now, of course, the MG versions of these cars were later replaced with the GTI Metro, which had a K-Series in it. So very different power delivery, very different sound and feel of that car. Now, you might be thinking 72 horsepower sounds like absolutely nothing. But bear in mind how small and light this car actually is. So it's got very little to move around. So it does feel very sprightly indeed. Well, thanks for joining me today on Furious Driving, trying this lovely little MG Metro. It's a long time since I've been in an MG Metro. I've forgotten what a hoot they are. Just rorty and fun and old school feeling in a fairly modern package. If you've enjoyed this, please, as always, hit the like and subscribe buttons and the, the notification bell down the bottom corner. Hit that and find out when more cars are coming out and join me again next time when I'm driving something completely different.